and blessing our hearts. Well, it's good to be back with you today. Uh, it has been, uh, it seems like forever since uh, I've been here uh, behind the pulpit actually preaching. Uh, about three weeks ago, we had uh, Dr. Dave Burgraff here with us. Uh, Dave was um, rescheduled from April into May, and it just worked out that he was coming the week before we were going on vacation. So uh, we had uh, perfectly timed this vacation. You know how the things work out just perfectly? Like never? Um, and, and we went down at, on our way to Florida. Uh, we were going down on the Keys, and uh, we stopped in Myrtle Beach because our daughter-in-law uh, was pregnant and due on May 20th, which is Friday. So we get in there and uh, we we're staying overnight, and my son comes and says, um, we're leaving for the hospital, and so I thought that's great, and so we get up with the, the first grandson and gave him breakfast, and his little brother was born a couple hours later. It just it worked out perfectly. We got to see the baby, did all those fun things, held the baby, and then we took off and went on vacation, which is what grandparents do, right? I mean, you're just supposed to be there some of the time, right? You just kind of whoop, whoop. Um, and then we came back through there and we spent a few days with them and, and uh, our daughter-in-law wasn't feeling too well so we were able to help her out and uh, just be able to, to be a blessing hopefully to them uh, through that time too. So it just absolutely worked out really, really great. It was just great to um, get away from it all and uh, be able to be on the bottom of the ocean where there's no cell phones <laughs> and to be able to uh, see all of God's creation uh, under the water. So that was a lot of fun. Just um, really had a great time. Good to be back. See, the weather hasn't changed in three weeks or two weeks. <laughs> it's still uh, humid and, and raining, but that's okay. This morning we're in 2 Thessalonians and uh, excited about being in 2 Thessalonians this morning. These gentlemen have some Bibles in their hands, so if slip up your hand if you don't have a Bible with you or don't have a Bible at all, and they're more than happy to give you a Bible. If you don't have one, please feel free to, to take that with you, um, when you when you leave as well. Well, we have um, certainly uh, a lot of fun things planned this summer, and let me just mention on Wednesday night this week, uh, we do start our Daniel study, as uh, Ed announced and we just encourage you to come on out for that. Uh, there may be a sign-up sheet in the foyer. There may be, yeah, there is one, so you can sign up for that. The only reason we need to know how many are coming is because we're printing up some uh, syllabuses, and so we wanna know how many to print up. So looking forward to that. Also, again, next Sunday, we have a baptism planned. Uh, if you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, see me right after the service. Um, we can get that uh, kind of worked up so that we can get a chance to meet and talk about it uh, ahead of time. That would be just fantastic. Uh, so uh, a lot of things going on this summer. Um, I, I, we kind of go into summer mode. You ever notice that as a church? Kind of go into summer mode. But I'm excited. We have a lot of things going on this summer. So there's a lot of really fun things, some exciting things. I believe God's still at work during the summer. Do you believe that? God, God's still at work, and people are still coming to Christ uh, during the summer. So we want to be active uh, serving the Lord and uh, doing His will uh, throughout the summer. You never know. The Lord's return could be right around the corner. Amen? We are in 2 Thessalonians this morning. It's hard to believe we're back here in 2 Thessalonians, and God is doing some great things here with the Thessalonican church, and it's amazing to me as I go through this passage of Scripture uh, to take a look at what was happening there in Thessalonica and being able to understand how it impacts us here today. So a lot of amazing things as we, as we look at this passage of Scripture. Have you ever felt, and it's kind of been the theme of some of the songs that were sung here this morning, have you ever felt that it just seems uh, like wickedness in the world is flourishing and justice is absent? Uh, have you ever thought that? Maybe you've thought that for yourself. Uh, maybe you've had situations where you've be ro been wronged and, and un in an unfortunate way, it wasn't due to anything that you had done, and yet you're treated poorly for some reason. Uh, maybe people have been uh, mean to you. Maybe people have been unfair with you. Uh, maybe you have looked at life, and at times you get discouraged because there's pain there, and, and you're pushing through that pain, or you're pushing through a life that is, is filled with unfairness. And you look to the day when things will be made right. You look to the time 
when everything is as it's supposed to be. We live in a world that is really, in a lot of ways, upside down. In fact, as you look around, you see unrighteousness just seemingly to triumph all the time. And as time has gone by, and uh, Dr. Burgraff talked about this, we live in the midst of a cultural revolution, and it's not a good thing. It's not a revolt in the right direction towards righteousness. It's a revolt against God. And we look at all of these things, and we say to ourselves, wow, Will things ever be made right? And that's what this passage takes into consideration here this morning. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty typical introduction from the Apostle Paul. And then Paul goes on and it's almost a similar tone to what we saw in 1 Thessalonians when Paul would commend them for the things that they were doing. But Paul says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all of your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. There is a word of encouragement here that goes out to this group of Christians who are experiencing this new way of life in such a radical way that it's presenting itself with many difficulties and trials. But Paul is going to tell them that there is a new day coming. There is a time coming when God will make all things right. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. Shall we pray? God, we just ask your blessing on the word of God today. Father, as we look around us, we recognize that there is much unfairness. There's a lot of wrong in this world. In fact, Lord, we would have to acknowledge that there's always been a lot of injustice. We read through the Old Testament and we recognize, Lord, that that is one of the prevalent themes in the prophet's writings, speaking and dealing with injustices. And yet, Father, we know that your plans for us make all things right. That there is indeed a day of reckoning. There is a day when you will judge and judge righteously. So we pray, Father, this morning that you would bless this passage of Scripture to our hearts. May we be encouraged by it. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Paul begins with his thankfulness here for the church at Thessalonica. We pick it up in verses 3 and 4, verses that I just read, where Paul is commending them for their spiritual growth. And as their spiritual growth is mentioned, he he singles out two things. He talks about faith and love. These were actually things and themes that he had prayed for with regard to the Thessalonians. He had prayed that they would abound in their love. He prayed that their faith would would grow. And that's exactly what takes place here. He says here that your faith is greatly enlarged. It is growing exceedingly. And he uses a a literary device there to, um, to actually emphasize this. It doesn't read well in the English if you translated it literal. But get this, the preposition that he uses is speaking of a faith that is over and above, and it, it, it's something that is absolutely flourishing. And what Paul has in mind is, is coming from the botanical world where you're looking at a plant that grows up. I don't know about you, but is your grass growing pretty quick these days? I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I think I could cut it about every four hours. Well, Paul is looking at the botanical world and he's saying, you know, you're like a plant that has grown up. Your branches are pushing outward. You're you're seeking the sun. You're, You're growing and flourishing. And that's how he saw their faith. And faith is so important because when this faith is in focus, it's denoting here a personal confidence and an absolute trust in God. And that's not always easy when the conditions of life, the circumstances of life are pressing down on us. Their confidence in God was unwavering. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about this type of faith. It's easy to have faith in God when everything's going right, when things are perfect. But when we're challenged, how is our faith going to react? For some people, their faith withers up 
but not the case with the Thessalonians. Their faith is expanded. And this is why Paul is so stoked when he starts talking about this church. He not only talks about their faith, but he talks about their love. And he says, you know what's amazing is your love is abounding He says, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. That idea of growing there that he uses is a word that's translated oftentimes abound. And it has to do with an irrigation uh, that a farmer would use. So a farmer's going to go and he's going to irrigate his fields. And so you don't have those long irrigation, like big sprinkler systems that you see out on the eastern shore. Uh, It's not like that. If you wanted to irrigate, you would actually uh, remove the dam that would hold uh, perhaps a, a body of water, a lake or a pond, and it would flood your field. And that is what the picture here is that Paul is trying to use. He's saying, your faith is great. It's growing like a tree. Your love is abounding. It's like an irrigation. It is going out and it's overflowing. And it's so amazing given the circumstances that I'm commending you and boasting about you to the other churches. I'm telling other churches where the people are under great pressure to cave in. I'm telling them that you guys are doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're flourishing amidst the persecution. Well, you and I have been truly blessed to live in the United States of America where we have uh, not endured persecution. But these people have, and it's been really tough for them. And so Paul is going to boast over this church. I want you to see here in verse 4, he says, Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches. And the reason for that is your perseverance and your faith in the midst of all of this. And he says, in the midst of your persecutions and afflictions, which you endure. The word literally for endure means to hold yourself up. You're still standing straight, he's saying. Uh, well, all of this coming upon you, he says, it's amazing, but you're, you're still standing. I often wonder that when the persecution comes to Christians in the United States, how many will be still standing? I wonder what that will look like because Paul just seems like he's out of his mind excited about the Thessalonians because they're still standing straight. They're still on both feet. You and I have not endured that type of, nor have we really experienced this type of persecution, have we? We don't have any idea what people are going to do when that persecution comes. And I do believe that the day is coming here for the United States and the church in America where there will be persecution. If God tarries, you can count on it. Because the mindset in this cultural revolution is shifting further and further away from those types of orthodox teachings that have been commonly held. And the things that we've talked about in the past that were common sense are no longer part of the equation. They're not part of the discussion. Oh, my friends, listen and understand that persecution is coming to the church in America as it has been extended throughout the ages to Christians everywhere. We have been immune. We've been so blessed here. But these days are changing. These people are so commendable because they're still standing upright. They've endured But not only have they endured, they have, and you'll notice the word there, perseverance. Perseverance is an amazing term, upomone in the Greek. This word was originally kind of a neutral word, but then it came to be prominent as it was used in Greek virtues. And so when the Greeks would list all of their virtues, if you happened to be one who persevered, you were uh, counted in this list of virtues. And so if you looked at a list of virtues, you'd say, well, it's a good thing if you would have perseverance. Perseverance is different than the word patience in the Greek. There's a slight difference here between the two, and the difference should be noticed. You and I, it's, it's funny because when we read our English Bibles, we, we read right through these things, but in the original language, this word spoke of an active and an energetic resistance to hostile power. In other words, understand this. 
that as their persecution was coming and it was pressing down on them, they didn't just have patience and remain under that load of persecution. They took a stand and they were willing to let their faith be seen in a hostile environment where they paid dearly for that faith. It wasn't like they went underground. It wasn't like they all of a sudden said, well, I guess we can't live out our Christian life in a, in a real way so that the world sees it anymore. We're going to just kind of shrink back. You remember that's what some of the apostles, or the, uh, some of the apostles, some of the followers of Jesus did when the crucifixion took place. Do you remember that? Uh, all of a sudden, they were nowhere to be found. This word perseverance speaks of being able uh, to withstand this difficulty while still being proactive in bringing forth their faith. And so amidst this persecution, this group of people are still willing to take the stand. This is a basic attitude, and it's a basic attitude of the righteous all the way back to the Old Testament and into Judaism as well. You see uh, this type of thinking, and it was very positive because there was always a view towards a future kingdom. Things are going to be all right. Whether you were back in the Old Testament and you were clinging to the Abrahamic covenant and the promises associated with Abraham, and you were looking at that and you're saying, hey, someday it's all going to work out. Or if you're a Jew uh, during the, the Maccabean period of time and you're saying, well, I know the kingdom of God is at hand. God is going to work all of these things out. Everything's going to be made right. And then when you get into the New Testament, you find that the same teaching is true. That in the New Testament, we have the same outlook we're looking for now that the spiritual kingdom is here. People who place their faith in Jesus Christ alone can find forgiveness of their sins. They can be guaranteed eternal life because of what Christ has done for them. But we are not only looking at a spiritual kingdom but there is going to be yet a physical kingdom as well. A new heaven and a new earth that Jesus Christ is even today preparing for those who love him. Is that great? And so this basic attitude continues on. So what Paul wants to do, in light of, in light of their testimony and in light of the persecution that they're experiencing, he wants to give them something that's going to be an encouragement to them. He wants to teach them some things and get their focus aligned properly. Notice with me here that in verse five he says, this is a plain indication, this, these persecutions, these afflictions that you're dealing with, he said it's a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. God is going to bring a judgment that is truly righteous. Every one of God's judgments are righteous. When you think of judgment, you, you may think of, in a negative way. You might think of judgment that involves a punishment. And certainly at times it does. But then there's also judgment that brings about reward. The point is when God makes everything right and there is a day of reckoning as it will be, God will make all things right. And those who have been laying up treasures in heaven will be justly rewarded. And those who have not will be dealt with as well. God is righteous. The persecution, he says, that you're going through is a plain indication so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. Wow. The word considered worthy, it should be, um, it could be considered deserving. These people are deserving of the kingdom of God in the sense that as they have served the Lord, they are worthy of being in the kingdom. And it's not to say that those who suffer are automatically placed in the kingdom. That's not all, at all what he's talking about. In fact, the only way you and I can gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ, isn't it? And so only faith alone is what brings about salvation. But what Paul is saying here is that those who are going through this type of persecution, those who are enduring, he says, basically you are to be considered and considered worthy uh, because all these things are happening to you because you are a person of faith. You are a Christian. That's why you're going through these turmoils. The Thessalonians were having a nice peaceful life. They're on the 
fast track to hell, but things were good while they were living here. And all of a sudden, they heard the gospel. They heard, oh, Jesus died on the cross. He was he raised from the dead after three days, and he ever lives to make intercession for us. And if we place our faith and trust in him and him alone, we can have newness of life. And they thought to themselves, wow, that's fantastic. They placed their faith in Jesus. And all of a sudden, the world came crashing down on them. And they're looking around going, what did we do? Why are we all of a sudden so offensive to the world? What made me offensive overnight? Some of you have testimonies. of When you placed your faith in Jesus and all of a sudden you found there was a tremendous amount of resistance. Maybe it came from family members. Maybe it came from friends. But all of a sudden, because you made that one decision to trust Jesus, your life changed. Your life got flipped upside down. And what Paul is saying here is that that this persecution by the wicked demonstrates not only that the wicked deserve punishment, but also that the church is on the side of good. The church, those who have faith in Jesus, these believers are on the right side. I think of the verse of scripture over in 2 Timothy in chapter two, uh, verse 12. It's a trustworthy statement, he says. Uh, for if we died with him, we will also uh, live with him. Uh, if we endure, uh, we'll also, what, reign with him. You see, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to encourage them uh, that if they would do those things which are, are consistent with the Christian life, we have something tremendous to look forward to. And Paul is talking about something that's in the future that they should be aware of. And you and I should be aware of this as well. Notice with me here, as you look at this passage, uh, you see that they're worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. You see, God is just in being able to repay uh, that which is evil. God is going to judge. God is going to bring about this justice that is fair and appropriate. That's what he's talking about here when he talks about repaying with affliction those who afflict you. I want to just read a a quote that I came across that I think speaks really well to this. It says, the principle of just requital lies at the basis of our belief in a moral universe. Our sense of justice demands such a requital. Not good but evil creates a moral problem for us. In the face of the present injustices, our conscience tells us that there must be a future retribution. A world in which justice was not done at last would not be God's world at all. Did you get that? A world in which justice was not done at last would not be God's world at all. Take your Bibles and go with me over to the book of Psalms, which is about in the middle of your Bible book of Psalms, and go and find with me, please, chapter 139. Psalm 139. How many here have heard of the term imprecatory psalms? Few of you have. Can you just say that word with me, please? Imprecatory. Imprecatory. It's kind of a fun word to say, isn't it? Imprecatory. The imprecatory psalms, and there's a whole bunch of these uh, imprecatory psalms. Uh, Look them up, Google them up on uh, your computer sometime. They start in chapter 5, there's a verse. Chapter 10, there's a verse. Uh, Chapter 31, chapter 35, there's a few verses. Chapter 40, there's a couple verses. Chapter 58, there's five verses. When you get to chapter 69, there's a whole section there that are imprecatory Psalms. When you get to chapter 139, you also have some infused there and a couple verses as well in chapter 140. I want you to look at this and look with notice with me in Psalm 139 and verse 23. This is a great passage of scripture, one that you probably know fairly well. It says, Search me, O God, 
and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Search me, O oh God. Do you know that? Do you remember that old hymn? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart, I pray. Do you remember that? It's a wonderful verse of scripture where David, the author of Psalm 139, is writing and he says, Search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts, know my heart. Apply testing to me, he says. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be a wicked way in me as the song goes. When you come to God and you say, God, search me and know my heart, you basically are coming to God and exposing all of your inner thoughts and all of your inner motivations and you're exposing them to the righteousness of God. That's a tall order, isn't it? Well, David seems like he's just the person to be able to do that. Notice, if you back up there to verse 17, I'm just going to pick it up here, but he says, how precious also are your thoughts, capital Y, speaking of God's thoughts, to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. How precious also are your thoughts to me. He says, your thoughts to me being so wonderful are more numerous than the sand that's along the seashore. And he says, when I awake, I am still with you. David says, when I go to sleep and I wake up in the morning, my thoughts are, are basically about you, God. And you're thinking about me. In fact, your thoughts towards me are more numerous than the sand along the seashore. Isn't it amazing that God is thinking about us? God is thinking about you. And David has this really personal relationship with, with God that is so vibrant. It's no wonder he's described as a man after God's own heart. But notice with me the imprecatory verses that are right in the middle of these two. He says, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you, God, wickedly, and your enemies... Take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They've become my enemies. Whew. Now that's a passage of scripture that you just need to whack and get it out of there, right? It just really doesn't jive well with the New Testament and the whole aspect of loving your enemies. And it is amazing, but theologians are doing backflips to try to somehow deal with the imprecatory psalms. Uh, they're saying, well, you know, it's a different Hebrew mood, and maybe, maybe he was meaning this, and maybe he's meaning that, and, and maybe it's just based on, you know, we just need to ignore these verses because progressive revelation, we have more revelation. By the time you get to the New Testament, we're all about love and Bobby Sherman and whatever, and, and less about the holiness of God. But it presents a problem because it doesn't jive well with our thinking, we don't like to stop and consider the judgment of God. Uh, we don't like to stop and think about the, the holiness of God. But as I look at this passage of Scripture and the other imprecatory psalms as well, I recognize that the hatred may be moral, more of a moral repugnance rather than a personal vengeance. I, I don't see that so much. But I think if we just throw out the terminology that we always throw out, hate the sin and love the sinner, we sometimes can, can miss the point. John Piper writes, he says, there is a kind of hate for the sinner viewed as morally corrupt and hostile to God that may coexist with pity and even a desire for their salvation. He says this, he says, you might hate the spinach without opposing its good use. You see, the difficulty in taking these imprecatory psalms and removing them all together from Scripture is that if you do that, you're actually taking some of the words of Jesus and some of the teaching of the Apostle Paul out as well. Jesus spoke of these imprecatory psalms 
as he goes through in his teaching. He didn't avoid these at all. And we know that Jesus is the embodiment of the love of God, that he is the expressed image of God. And as such, he is demonstrating mercy to the world. And yet he would quote Psalm 69 and verse 4 there in John 15, they hated me without cause. Uh, Verse 9, he would say, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Uh, They gave me gall for my foods. Chapter 69, verse 21. Uh, These are Psalms that Jesus quoted. And Paul quotes the imprecatory words of Psalm 69, 22 and 23 over in Romans chapter 11 and he speaks to them as as having old testament authority and so he regards these words of of imprecation as inspired and not sinful paul also goes on and he reads the imprecatory psalms as the words of christ uh, later on there in romans chapter 15 you see we recognize that these verses are inspired by god that God is going to bring judgment upon the world is not in question. It's not the issue. God is going to make all things right. And why is God delaying the coming of this judgment? Well, he delays the coming of the judgment because he's waiting on people like you and me who have placed our faith in Christ for others to place their faith in Christ. But going back here to Thessalonians, notice with me there, that he says that God will repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. We are coming into a a section here in 2 Thessalonians that's actually prophetic. But Paul begins by describing here not only a righteous judgment but a just judgment. And he speaks about a coming time when the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the return of the king, is going to take place. And then when Christ comes back, all things will be set right. The judgment will come, and the wicked will be afflicted, and the righteous will be lifted up, and they will be rewarded. You see, you don't want to mistake the fact that God is being patient with us today with the reality of his coming. I think of the church in heaven and the tribulation saints in particular over in Revelation chapter 6. When they're there and these who have been beheaded because of their faith in Christ during that seven years of tribulation, they're there and they're asking God, how long until you bring vengeance upon those who have killed us? And indeed that day would come. For when the revelation or the the revealing of the Lord Jesus takes place, what will happen will absolutely shake the world. And Paul is trying to encourage these believers. There is a judgment that is coming. It is absolute and it is real. Do you realize that probably the greatest, most dramatic event in world history is the return of Christ, the second coming? We've talked about the rapture of the church where Christ removes the church from the earth. But the second coming will take place at the end of the tribulation time. I think of this in the light of Zechariah chapter 14. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from the east to the west by a very large valley. So that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. When Jesus Christ comes back, this is a grand event. He will come, he will bring the saints with him, the Bible says. And when that takes place, it will change the world forever. The world is resisting. Here's a little map. We'll be studying some of these things on Wednesday night. 
talking about these tribulation judgments, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl or the vial judgments, all of this judgment will be poured out. And at the end of that time, the return of Christ comes. What an amazing time that will be. And Paul is trying to tell these Thessalonians, listen, I commend you for keeping on, remaining upright, enduring with a perseverance that is not shrinking back from this world, but is overt in its testimony before the world. You're living out your faith, and you should continue to do that because there's a day coming when Jesus Christ is going to return. And everything will be made right. I want you to see one thing here as we look at this final passage. He says in verse 9, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. And he uses that descriptive terminology, away from, from. And he's speaking here about a separation from the presence of the Lord. Now, I find it absolutely ironic that the people today who would reject God receive as payment God's rejection. The world wants to reject God. The world is doing everything it can to reject God. And it's kind of like one of those things where you have to be careful what you wish for. People want God out of their life. I was just reading about the new, uh, newer prime minister in, in Greek, Greece, and he is uh, an interesting fellow. It's the first time there's been an atheist who's the prime minister of Greece. He wants nothing to do with God. He respects other religions, but he wants nothing to do with God. I was also reading about the European Union, the parliament building, in the 1500s, there was an artist who drew a painting. He painted a picture of the Tower of Babel. And what in his mind was that grand tower that Nimrod had built back in Genesis. You remember the place that God came down and destroyed? And he scattered the languages of all humanity because man was united and they were unfortunately united against him. And so when they built the parliament building there for the European Union, they modeled it after the painting, the 1500s. Europe, one voice, mocking God. You could destroy us once, you could put us down, you could separate us out, but no more. You see, mankind is pushing away God at every turn. And we as Christians need to bring to bear the truth of the love of Christ. We need to continue to go out into the highways and byways and share the love of Christ. We need to carry on the testimony of Jesus Christ. But there is coming a day of reckoning. And unfortunately, if there are people who have rejected God and wanted God out of their life, the judgment will be, the penalty of eternal destruction where they are pushed away from the presence of God himself. And hell will be that place. Hell will be a place where people no longer have the presence of God. And oh, how they will long for the presence of God because it is only God who can deliver them. But alas, God gives them what they seek and there is no return from that. These are sobering thoughts but the encouragement to the saints comes from the Apostle Paul. And he says in verse 11, To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is God calling us to do? One of the things that I recognize is vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I have nothing to do with that. I am supposed to go out and show the world love. I'm supposed to continue to abound in that love. I'm continuing to expand my faith. Uh, that's what I'm called to do. But I rest assured that God is in control of all things and that he makes everything right. There is coming a day when things will be set right. 
and we will know that it is God who is on the throne. Amen? And so he encourages the Thessalonians, keep on going. You see, the difficulty for the Thessalonian church was that they thought, because all this persecution was crushing down on them, that somehow they'd miss the day of the Lord. They thought somehow Christ had come and they were left out of the picture. And so they were, became very anxious over that. Bad theology had followed and there was a lot of teaching that was incorrect. And so when we get into chapter 2 next week, we'll begin to, to parse through some of that teaching concerning the coming of the Lord and what some of the signs are that, that show us that Jesus Christ is actually coming soon. It's an exciting time when you get into 2 Thessalonians. It truly is. You won't want to miss the next couple weeks as we go through and, and pull those sections apart that talk about the Antichrist and some of the things that will go on in this world preceding the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most important thing, if you're here today and there's questions in your own heart and mind over whether or not your faith is in Jesus Christ and in him alone, let me urge you today to make the decision to place your faith in Christ because Christ is the answer. It removes us from the wrath of God and it brings us into fellowship with him. And what a joy and what a blessing it is to know that we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. As we bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, how important it is for us to stop and think about our relationship with the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and God spoke into your heart about where you're going to spend your eternity. There's nothing better than knowing for sure that you are a person of faith, that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. All of the religious activities and things that you could do uh, will not save you. The only thing that will save you is a faith in Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. If you've never done that, let me urge you this morning to take that step of faith and place it totally in Jesus Christ. Would you all stand with me, please? We'll have a word of prayer. Care teams are here at the front. If you'd like to pray with someone, talk with someone, uh, they'll be here at the front after the service. Let's pray, shall we? God, we thank you and we praise you, Father, for who you are. We thank you, Father, that we serve a living Savior. We serve a risen Savior. We recognize, Lord, that as we live this life, that, Father, uh, you're in control, uh, that you're working all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Lord, how we thank you for the love that you've shown to us. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that they would today determine in their heart and mind to make that commitment to you by placing their faith in Jesus, that they might know that they have eternal life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving to us uh, the promise of eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the interaction that we see uh, even as we live out our faith in this world. Uh, Lord, we know there's challenges. We know it's difficult at times to live out our faith. But I pray, Father, that you would just uh, allow us, Lord, to be a consistent testimony to this world. And Father, we recognize, Lord, that there is a day coming where you will make all things right. Father, we leave that in your hands. We know that there is only one who is uh, qualified to be a judge of this world, and that is you, because you alone are righteous. Help us, Father, to demonstrate Christ's likeness as we live in this world, and help us, Father, to persevere no matter what is in the way, what is blocking us, Father. Help us, Lord, to carry out our faith and be a shining example to this world of what Christianity is. And even, Father, if this world rejects you, if they reject us because they've rejected you, and they persecute us, Lord, help us to keep on in faithfulness to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.